It's Canada's secret shame, an epidemic of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Indigenous women face a murder rate six times the national average. Every time you come out to this river, do you wonder if you'll recover her body? You come across remains and you don't know if they're human or not, or if they're your sister. The UN has censured Canada for its ongoing failure to address the crisis. The march is to send a message to the men who prey on them that they're being watched by the community. We see what's going on and we don't believe that our people deserve it. These guys do not discriminate. They go after anybody and everybody. Now, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's government is taking action. Those touched by this national tragedy have waited long enough. But after years of failure on the part of the police and the government, Many here question if it could possibly go far enough to bring justice for the families and keep women safe. It flashed through my mind that it could be a body that we were trying to pull up. We're in Winnipeg, which is one of the most violent cities in Canada. It also has the largest urban indigenous population in North America. And more indigenous women have gone missing or been murdered here than anywhere else in the country. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police, or RCMP, says nearly 1,200 indigenous women have gone missing or been murdered across Canada since 1980. But advocacy groups put the figure far higher at about 4,000 women. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's predecessor, Stephen Harper, largely dismissed the issue. Then, in 2015, Trudeau announced the creation of a two-year national inquiry to examine the epidemic as part of what he called a total renewal of Canada's relationship with its Indigenous people. But the inquiry has been plagued by delays, resignations, and allegations of government interference. Many here feel it may be destined to fail. Bernadette Smith's younger sister, Claudette Osborne Tayo, has been missing since 2008. Bernadette started Drag the Red in 2014 to support other families looking for answers after the bodies of several women were found in the Red River. The group uses homemade dragging bars with built-in hooks to search the bottom of the river. They hand over what they find to police and a team of forensic anthropologists. Every time we go out, we offer tobacco to give thanks for, you know, being able to be out here and do this work, but also to offer prayers to, you know, the families that are missing someone that don't have answers or who have been murdered and nobody's been brought to justice. Why this spot in particular? So this is the Alexander Dock, so there was two uh, young girls that were found here. In August 2014, the body of a 15-year-old Indigenous girl named Tina Fontaine was found in this river wrapped in plastic. Tina's death was a turning point that opened up a lot of people's eyes to this epidemic and sent shockwaves across the country. For many, it highlighted the failures of the system. In the hours before her death, she encountered the police, hospital staff, and child welfare workers. Tell me about your sister and how she went missing. I know she was only 21 at the time, 10 years ago. She'd been sexually abused when she was 12 and started running away from home. And she ended up with a much older man and was exploited and was pushed onto the streets. Claudette wasn't someone who didn't stay in contact with someone daily. Nobody had heard from her in two days. So my sister Tina went and she filed a missing persons report and the police basically said, you know, oh, she's out there somewhere, just give it a few days. And we kept going back to the police station and saying like, you know, something's wrong. They didn't take us seriously. They didn't investigate her case for 10 days. Well, yeah, so there's a prime example. That's what they pulled up. So there's no blood on it, but yeah. we pull up clothing all the time. We've pulled up lots of underwear, women's underwear, and people weight bodies down with cement, right? When they found Tina Fontaine's body, she, she was, was weighted, weighted down. down. Yeah. Here we go. No. Here. Oh wow, that's a strong tug. That's, that's a something, a something, place, eh? yeah, something definitely got caught on here. Oh, f yeah. Hang on. Yeah. Pull up. Jesus Christ, I have like... 
So that's a boot. More uh, cloth, possibly clothing, yeah. and a boot. It looks like there's a what? Remains inside. You want me to check for a foot? All right, they're, they're <laughs> telling me. They're telling me to check for a foot in, in here. Is a branch or a rock could be bone stuff? It flashed through my mind that it could be a body that we were trying to pull up, and it made me feel sick to my stomach, thinking that's what you guys are here to do. Our first year, there were seven bodies recovered from this river. So every year we've helped, and I don't even know how many. Your sister went missing 10 years ago. Every time you come out to this river, do you wonder if you'll recover her body? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. That's, that's a reality. You, know, you come across remains, and you don't know if they're human or not, or if they're your sister, like, it's an emotional roller coaster because you just never know. Three other women in Bernadette's family have gone missing or been murdered. Only one case has been solved. Should it be the police doing this? Absolutely, it should be. Policing is an issue in this country. We were on the streets putting up posters, talking to people, going to different organizations, going to different places we knew Claudette went to. You know, we were basically doing the police job for them and no family should have to do that. The Winnipeg police declined to speak with us on camera or give us a statement. Meet me at the Bell Tower is an anti-violence movement, and we exist to build community. Michael Champagne is an activist who organizes weekly anti-violence rallies in Winnipeg's primarily indigenous North End neighborhood. A new mural dedicated to missing and murdered women has just been painted in this weekly meeting place. And I saw we have these beautiful images in our community, but it's frustrating that they have to be memorial images. I wanted to know why it was necessary to hold weekly anti-violence rallies here. There was a time when in a year, we had over 52 vigils, funerals, hospital room visits, and our, the same group of people got together, but always centered around the negative things. We need to host weekly anti-violence here to send a message, not only to the community, but to the people that prey on our community. And our message is that we are united. Michael grew up in the child welfare system here and says that one out of six children in this neighborhood are currently in the care of the system. 7% of children across Canada are Indigenous, but they make up nearly half of all foster children in the country. The government cites poverty or lack of adequate food or housing as reasons for separating them from their birth families. What connections do you see between the child welfare system and the epidemic of missing and murdered Indigenous women? In the child welfare system, often what ends up happening is a devaluing of Indigenous life especially for Indigenous women and girls. As they age out of care, they turn 18, uh, unequipped with life skills, are severed from their biological families or their home communities. They're at risk of homelessness, harmful substance use, sexual exploitation. Part of the reason why we have such difficulties in child welfare today is that many of those children right now are actually children, like me, of Indian residential school survivors. From the 1840s to the mid-1990s, some 150,000 Indigenous children were removed from their families and sent to church and government-run Indian residential schools. Their aim was to kill the Indian in the child by assimilating them into dominant Canadian culture. Many children suffered emotional, physical, and sexual abuse while attending these schools. As we know now, Indian residential schools was a failed experiment that did a lot more harm than it did good and unfortunately that, that history of family separation over so many generations continues to this day with child welfare. It's 12.30 a.m. here in the North End neighborhood in Winnipeg and we've joined this midnight medicine walk organized by the community to reach out to women here that are being sexually exploited to offer them prayers and medicine and let them know that they're being watched after. And also, the march is to send a message to the men who prey on them that they're being watched by the community. Lauren Shopek is the founder of the walk. 
She was once a missing Indigenous woman herself. Lauren ran away from home as a teenager and was trafficked on these streets where she narrowly escaped a serial killer. How did the idea of the Midnight Medicine Walk come about? Through my own experiences um, of being exploited, I wanted to do something to acknowledge those people as who they actually really are and acknowledge their spirits, honor their spirits, instead of just walking past them every day or just driving past them every day, thinking of them as homeless people or as prostitutes because that's not who they are. Tell me about some of the interactions you have with these women that you're reaching out to on the streets and what really sticks with you. They tear up, these women, because they're finally being recognized. And they might not feel like they deserve that, that kind of standing ovation that we give them when we stop and we sing for them. Or we offer them a smudge, they feel like they don't deserve it what they do and they're finally being paid attention to. Is this process really healing for you? It is. It is really healing for me. Out of all those negative experiences I had as a young girl being sexually exploited, now people recognize me and they respect me for those things, I guess, but like in a different way because now I'm, I turned it into something beautiful, I guess. You have to go. You really can't be wondering. It's not safe. As we turned the corner onto the main boulevard, we were told that no one takes this road at night unless they're looking for sex. What message are you guys sending to the men out there who prey on these vulnerable women? That we see what's going on and that we don't believe that our people deserve it. I want them to see the community coming together. Because the police's response has been insufficient, Indigenous activists have been stepping up in various ways to ensure the safety of their community members and streets. Okay, so two groups of seven. Yep. We've got 14, right? James Favel is the executive director of the Bear Clan Patrol, a community safety patrol that operates in some of Winnipeg's toughest neighborhoods five to six nights a week. When we talk about the epidemic of missing and murdered Indigenous women and, and girls here in this country, do you see your work as trying to put an end to that in a small well, that's way? that's exactly why we started. In the wake of what happened with Tina Fontaine, I just wasn't prepared to sit around and watch anymore. I had to do something so that I could at least sleep at night and, and my conscience be clear. And so uh, we started up with 12 volunteers in, in 2014 and now we have 1,200. How does that make you feel? It's pretty f***ing good. Tell me a little bit more about the sexual exploitation you see on these streets. Well, I mean, it's, yeah, the prostitution here, the, the, it's, it was pervasive for a very long time and there was no, uh, nobody doing anything about it. It was like it was permitted in this area, you know, and for, for us in, here in this community, that's not, a, that's not suitable, right? We have, uh, we have the, 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 the exploited women, you know, standing up against Buddy's fence, you know, and the kids are playing in the yard and we've got Johns coming. And these guys do not discriminate. They go after anybody and everybody. They don't care if you're 10 years old or if you're 40 years old. Why hasn't the state or the city done more to crack down on these Johns? The political will's not there. Canada's national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls is expected to conclude in April of 2019. The inquiry is examining the systematic causes of violence against Indigenous women and girls and making recommendations for how to keep them safe, at a cost of $53.8 million. During our time in Winnipeg, we heard from those who feel the inquiry may not be up to the task. Our family um, didn't participate in the national inquiry. We called for a national action plan. You know, women are still going missing, they're still being murdered, and uh, there's no really uh, resources or prevention put in place to stop that from happening. I feel like this inquiry needs to be led by experiential family members that actually know what it's like to lose a loved one so that we have an appropriate amount of urgency um, behind the work that we're doing. Tasha Spillett is an academic and educator who's been following the inquiry. I don't see that there'll be any outcome in it unless there's real legal teeth from that um, from that inquiry, we're going to have to have another inquiry in 50 years, another one in 100 years, another one in 150 years, if 
we don't understand that at the bottom of this is a really harmful power dynamic in which indigenous women and girls are situated um, at the bottom. We wanted to take these concerns to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, but his office declined our request for an interview. Instead, they directed us to Carolyn Bennett, the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations. For months, we reached out to her office for an interview and eventually received a statement that stresses the government's commitment to, in their words, end this national tragedy and lists the initiatives it's taking to support affected communities and prevent future violence. In the meantime, as Canada's government struggles to repair its relationship with its indigenous population, the communities here are continuing to search for their missing women while trying to stop the next one from being murdered. We've made it uh, part of Claudette's legacy to help other families to do whatever we can to create awareness, to, to honor her. Hey everyone, it's Dina. So how much did you know about the epidemic of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls? Let me know in the comments and be sure to check out our next Direct From episode where I travel to British Columbia to report on the fight against the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Make sure to like and share this video and subscribe to AJ+.